Sarah Allen is our speaker this evening, and she has been a librarian here at the Genealogy Center for 10 years, and her areas of interest, of research interest, include Indiana, the Midwest and Upper South, DNA testing, and Eastern European research. So I will hand it over to her, and we'll go ahead and get started. So tonight we're going to talk about your DNA match is adopted. Now what? And first of all, the reality is that on your DNA match page right now, there are people on there who are adopted who are seeking their birth family. They may or they may not reach out to us for assistance. So what are we going to do when that happens? And some people are going to come to one conclusion and other people are going to come to another conclusion. So um, there are going to be differing opinions about this. Now, before we kind of go in that direction, I do want to mention that there is a DNA, um, a genetic genealogy, I believe it's called Code of Ethics. And if you Google that, you should be able to find that. And one of the precepts of that code of ethics is that you want to, before you recruit a relative to take a DNA test for you, you want to make sure that that person is giving you informed consent. And informed consent means that you let them know ahead of time that some unexpected results could um, ensue after they get their DNA tested. They could find out there's an unknown adoption in their family. They could find out there's a misattributed parentage. There's an unknown sperm donation. There's an unknown affair. And so does that person want to continue with the idea of testing, knowing that this might happen? So we should be um, going over that with um, our family members before we get them to test. Now, I didn't know this when I started out. And so I tested a bunch of family members in the, in the late 2000s, early 2010 time period where I didn't have their informed consent. But you know, now that we know better, we try to do better, right? So going forward the last four or five years since I've known about that code of ethics, I've tried to abide by it. So when you are approached by a DNA match who is adopted, you want to perhaps have already thought through what you wanted to do in this eventuality. Think about the scenario before it happens to you. There's really no right or wrong answer. Each of us decides our comfort level in helping an adoptee. And some of you are probably saying, well, why would there be any question about what you would do with an adoptee? Well, I have to tell you that there are people out there who feel very strongly about this issue, both one way or another. And so there are people who believe that you should help any and every person that approaches you on your DNA match page. You know, regardless of what their story is, you should be, try to be helpful. You should try to be giving and helping. You know, we like to be helpers. Um, and, and there are people that believe very passionately that adopted people should, you know, have all the information that they can have about their birth family. Then there are other people who might believe that, but they don't want to get involved. They would say, this is my DNA. Um, I took this DNA test and I didn't take it um, to get involved in somebody else's business. That's their business. That's their family business. It doesn't concern me. I won't get involved. So if an adoptee approaches that person, they might politely decline to help. And what I'm saying is there's no right or wrong. Each of us has to decide how we would handle this and what our comfort level is. And of course, there are all sorts of in-between scenarios where you might help some per at some point, but at another point, you might feel uncomfortable with helping. So it, it may all depend on the situation as well. If I found a DNA match on my match list who was a distant relative, I might think to myself, well, what's the, there's no harm in me helping that person because they're distant. They're a distant relative. 
they're probably not anybody that I would know in, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know who their parents are. They're so far back on my tree. On the other hand, if I got a DNA match to a close relative who turns out to be adopted, this definitely impacts my personal close family members. And it could have the potential to get very messy and very sticky. Now, I personally would decide to help that person, but some of you might make a different decision. If you found out that your sibling gave up a child for adoption or your grandmother gave up a child for adoption and this was a closely guarded family secret. So there's all kinds of different permutations of this um, situation. And what you decide to do is totally up to you. Now, there are different perspectives or points of view from uh, the different people that are involved in an adoption. And so these slides are just to give you an idea of some of the perspectives. I certainly haven't listed all of the perspectives and I'm not an adoptee, nor have I um, adopted a child out. So I'm, I'm kind of speculating on some of what these points of view would be. So I haven't included everything, but those are some of the main, um, main viewpoints maybe. So the biological parents, many of which were promised privacy at the time of the adoption, they wanted to um, give this child up and um, kind of go on with their lives. Um, were promised privacy at the time of the adoption. They were told the child would never be able to find them or track them down. And DNA testing has upended this. Their, their child could find them and track them down, even if they themselves do not take a DNA test. And some are now quite disturbed that they're being contacted while others are overjoyed. So it really just depends. Adopted parents in the same way have, some, have been promised that uh, privacy at the time of the adoption. And there are some adopted families that have never told their child that they were adopted. And so for those particular families, DNA testing has upended this. Again, the child can find out that they were adopted by taking a DNA test. And some are happy for their child to find bio family and some are not. The adopted person, now there's not one, strictly one kind of adopted person. They, I've, I've talked to many adopted people and they all have a slightly different perspective. There are some who have never pondered looking for their biological family. And there are others who have wanted to find them, but just haven't tried very hard. And then there are others that are very driven to find their adopted family. And others who have changed their mind over time. They may have started out not really caring, but as they have gotten older, they have changed their mind and are now interested in finding out. Um, like I just mentioned, some adopted people do not even know that they are adopted. They have not been informed by their family. Should they want to track down the official records of their adoption? They may be from a state or a country that has closed adoption records. So they may have no way to access the official records of their adoption. Some of them have medical conditions that their doctor has said to them are, are inherited, hereditary, and that it would behoove them to track down their biological family, but they have no way of doing so. A lot of adopted people have no idea of their ethnic background never seen pictures of family members, but DNA testing has given some of them, the ones that choose to, has given those that choose a method of finding out their about their biological family and it gives them hope. Now then there's you and I. We are the kind of the bystanders. We're the extended family we're in the DNA match list. We're not the adopted person, and we're not the adopted, or we're not the bio parent. We're we're just somebody else in the family, and a lot of us want to be helpful, and we just we believe that adopted people deserve to know their background. But on the other hand, assisting an adoptee could put you in the middle of a family secret, potential awkward situation, 
and we might not want to meddle in another close family member's business. And there are different things that we can do to help the adopted person. Um, we can uh, provide them with information on who you think the biological family might be. You can even provide them some pointers on navigating family dynamics. You can provide photos. You can provide medical information about yourself and your branch of the family if you feel com comfortable with that. Um, you do not want to make contact with the bio family for the adopted person. Um, even if you think it might help smooth the way, it really is um, up to the adopted person to make the first contact and to get that relationship started out on the right track. So our job is to step back when they're ready to make the contact. And the only thing that I would say that, the only situation where I would say you could possibly make an exception to that would be if it's a really close family member. And, you know, if it turns out you have a, a half brother or half sister, and you think that you can approach your parent um, in a better way you know, to kind of smooth the way for the person. I would say maybe that would be okay. But for these other relationships, no, let the adopted person make the first contact. And of course, you can start out helping an adopted person and then change your mind and decide not to. If you start to feel uncomfortable, if you feel unsafe, you can end communication with a person just like any other relationship. So Try to let the person down nicely, but, you know, say, basically, I've, you know, helped you and given you this, I've gotten you this far in this, the process, and I don't think I can help you anymore. Um, just kind of setting that boundary. So you can, you can stop at any time um, should the circumstances change, in your circumstances change. All right, so. Let's go ahead and talk about the adopted DNA match that I had with a guy named Steve. So we're gonna use Steve as a case study. He's a real person, he, he con or I contacted him actually, but he was in my DNA on match list and I'll tell you what happened. So first of all, I did wanna mention that I have tested both of my parents recently at Ancestry.com and I did get their informed consent before I, I had them take the test and they both were fine with it. So even though I kind of mentioned, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of things, mom and dad, you know, there could be something weird that comes up in our DNA. If you test, we could find some, some kind of um, adoption or, um, unknown parents that type of situation. And my father was like, great, the more the merrier. And my mom said, well, we wouldn't have any of that in our family. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. Um, that's the difference in the personality between my two parents. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, the other part of my story that you might not know is that I've worked as a volunteer search angel for the past four or five years, helping adopted people find their families. So this is something that I've done quite a bit for other people, and I haven't been related to those people. But so if I ran across an adoptee that I was actually related to, of course I would want to help them, right? You know, it's a kind of a no-brainer. And yes, you know, when I thought about it, and I thought of some different scenarios, I thought, well, sure, I would help any adoptee who might contact me. So that was my pre-planning as far as you know, thinking through how I would handle this if it happened to me. So here's my um, first close adopted match. And he's not super close. He's a second to third cousin of mine, you can see there. And my initial thoughts when I saw this were cool. And, oh, I really want to help him. I'm so excited. And then I assumed, and you never want to assume, remember that, I assumed he is probably a distant relative of mine and not anyone that I would know personally, that I would know his parents personally um, in my family tree. And I think I assumed that because I wanted it to be true. So I didn't want it to get messy. I didn't want it to impact my life really at all 
for my family. I didn't want it to turn into an awkward situation. So I just said to myself, oh, I'm sure he's a distant relative and it won't be any problem to help him. So I think what happened was I, he has what's a three person tree. And when I clicked on it, they were all the people in it were private. And I just had some kind of intuition that he might be adopted. And so I messaged him. He didn't message me. And when I messaged him, he confirmed that he was indeed adopted. And this is what he told me. He said he was born in a Southern state in 1970. He took a DNA test and used adoption records. He was able to access his adoption records and he found his biological mother. She told him she was a teen at the time of his birth and unmarried, and she does not remember the name of his birth father. And that is a typical response of some of these mothers. Um, it's been years, 1970s is, you know, over 50 years ago. Um, she may truly not remember. So we have to give um, her the benefit of, of the doubt there. Um, so he is seeking his birth father. He's already found his mother. And so the father is somewhere on my family tree. That's what we can conclude from this because I'm not matching with his mother's side. So how can we figure out how Steve and his unknown father fit into my family tree? Well, these are the steps we're going to follow. We're gonna look at relationship predictions and estimates. We're gonna figure out if he is from my paternal or my maternal side. We're gonna study the shared matches between me and Steve to gain insight on the most recent common ancestor couple that we share. We're gonna examine the family of that most recent common ancestor couple for all males ruling in and out based on biographical research and DNA evidence. And once the possible bio family is identified, you often need to get them to take a DNA test to prove or disprove your theory of who the father might be, especially in the case of where there's several brothers in the family and you know that one of them is probably the father. So first of all, we're gonna look at relationship predictions. And this is just gonna give us an idea of where the adopted person fits on our tree. It's nothing, it's just a starting point. So there's gonna be a label that the DNA testing company gives you of a possible relationship. And then you're gonna look at your centimorgans in common. And so centimorgans are the unit of measurement for DNA. And the more centimorgans that you have in common with somebody, the closer you are matched to them. So you can see here again, this is from Ancestry DNA. So this is my match at Ancestry DNA Testing Company. And at Ancestry, you can see the, the label says we're second to third cousins. And then it says 145 CMs, which is CM is the abbreviation for centimorgans. So it says he's a second to third cousin. This is, you know, just a ballpark figure. So we're just going to look and determine who a second and third cousin really are. So we get a better idea. So a second cousin is descended from the same first great grandparents as you are. And a third cousin is descended from the same second great grandparents as you are. Um, so looking at a cousin chart, and this one is from Family Search. You can see there that over on the left, you've got me. And so you go up the tree. So parents, grandparents, great grandparents right here. Then I come down the tree over here and down to a second cousin. And then up the tree to my second great grandparents and down the tree to a third cousin. So this is showing you kind of out on paper about where in the tree Steve would be. He's either probably from my second or, or first great grandparent couple. Now, with your number of centimorgans, I suggest you become very comfortable with the DNA Painter website. So that's dnapainter.com. And on the dnapainter.com, you can see under tools at the top, this is a tool that's listed. It's called the Shared CM Project. And you just plop in your centimorgans, 145 in this case, and you get this nifty list of possible relationships. 
again, we are not um, trying to figure out which one of those it is right now. And so don't get too bogged down with this list. We're just getting our ballpark again. You can see that second cousin is listed there, third cousin is listed there. And these are probabilities. So this is saying 54 times out of 100, it's going to be one of these relationships. 21 times out of 100, it's going to be one of these relationships. And those are not in any order, by the way, those relationships here. At but 1% of the time, it could be one of these relationships. So you can always be in that 1%. So this is just giving us an idea. And but you want to be able to use the shared Centimorgan project to check out amounts of Centimorgans that you share with your DNA matches. So just be aware of that website. Now, what side of my family is Steve on? So this is going to start us on our process. And our process is very logic driven. So I hope you can follow the logic because I tried to make this as logical as possible. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the shared matches between me and Steve. This is on the match page. Usually all the DNA companies will show you shared matches and you want to get into the match page showing you and the match and then click on shared matches or sometimes it's called common matches. So we're going to see that either he matches my maternal side or my paternal side. And as long as I have a cousin or something that has tested on both my maternal side and my paternal side, I should be able to tell right away which side of the family Steve is on. Now, there'll be a couple exceptions. If my parents are related, then he's going to show up. If my parents are related to each other, then Steve would show up as a match probably to both of them. And that would be inconclusive, obviously. Um, if I'm from an endogamous population, such as Jewish, French Canadian, Amish, where people are intermarried with what everybody in the community is basically coming from an intermarriage situation a couple generations ago, where they just married other people in their Amish community over and over and over again. That would not, that, that does not work well with shared matches. Um, or if Steve is a close family match of mine, which he's not. Remember, he's labeled as a second to third cousin of mine. But if he was labeled as a close family match of mine, he could be related to both of my parents, meaning that he's either um, somehow um, coming from my side of the family or one of my siblings' side of the, sides of the family. But he's not. So with that said, he's going to match either my mother's side or my father's side. And this is what the shared matching looks like at the DNA company. So you've got the four main DNA companies that do autosomal DNA. My heritage calls it shared matches. Ancestry calls it shared matches. Family tree DNA calls it in common with or not in common with. And then 23andMe calls it relatives in common. So those are the things you need to look for at the DNA companies. So this is again from Ancestry DNA. So I'm at the match page between me and Steve, and you can see there that when I clicked on shared matches right there in the middle where the box is, he came up as a match to my father. So I know that he is matching my paternal side. So good. Now, can I determine whether he is from my paternal grandfather's side or my paternal grandmother's side? And again, if you have enough cousins that have tested where you know some of them are from your grandma's side and some of them are from grandpa's side, then you're going to be able to make this determination pretty easily as well. So when I look at the next matches, so after we get rid of my dad, the next shared match between me and Steve is Bill. Then there's S, T, and D. When I look at all of them and I know who they are, or I can tell you pretty quickly by looking at their tree, who they are, they are from my paternal grandfather's side. So now I can hone in on my paternal grandfather's side. Does everybody see that? So here's my tree and we're, we've eliminated my mom's side. Steve's not matching with anybody on my mom's side. My mom and dad are not related. So I wouldn't expect you know that to be uh, an issue. 
He's matching my dad who is tested. So, and he's also matching cousins up here on my grandpa, David Allen's side. So he's not matching Fanny, my grandma. So I've eliminated three quarters of my tree already. And I know that Steve has to be somewhere up here on this side. And he could be even a little further back on one of these, the Allen, Brown, or Kennedy lines here. But he's somewhere up here on this top part of the tree. That's where he's, he's branching off somewhere. So can we learn more about Bill, S, T, and D? Remember, those are the top shared matches between me and Steve. Well, yes, we can. I've done a lot of research on my share on my on my matches, I should say. Um, I've identified almost all of my matches, beginning with the third cousins and going up to the closest matches that I have. I know at least what family most of them are from, and I know some of you can't do that. But that's it's a worthy goal to have to try to identify your third cousin matches and closer so that if you come across this kind of situation where you are working with an adoptee, but you've already kind of done this groundwork where you identified a lot of your closer matches. So like I said, Bill, S, T, and D are identified and I know who they are. Bill is an Allen cousin. S and D are Brown Kennedy cousins. And then T is from the marriage of my great grandparents, David Allen and Alice Brown. So let me show you a little bit what I'm talking about here. This is going to try to show you how I'm sharing with Steve. So this is my great, my second great grandparents, Jacob and Melinda Allen. They are two Allens that married each other. So yes, they are, they are related to each other as husband and wife. Um, they're like second cousins with one another. They had my great grandfather David here and you can see I go down to um I come down from David and this couple had at least two other children they had Marion and Nettie and those are siblings of my great grandfather David and I have DNA matches to some descendants of Marion and Nettie so I have BF here and I have Bill and then I have BB actually also Steve is a match to Bill so Steve, the adopted guy, is a match with Bill, and he's a match with BF. So that's in, so that's telling me that Steve is a descendant of Jacob and Melinda somehow, okay? Just like I am. Now, the next thing that's a little interesting is that here's my other set of second great-grandparents on that side of the family, George Brown and Sarah Kennedy. And they are the parents of Alice Brown, who married David Allen. And you can see that I'm on that side of the family again. Alice Brown had at least two siblings, Fred and James, and they had descendants that have taken DNA tests. There's D here and S here. And I'm matching with D and with S, and so is Steve. So this is telling me that Steve is also a descendant of George Brown and Sarah Kennedy. So this is kind of curious, right? So if we look at this chart again, we see that Steve is matching both my great grandparents up on my paternal grandfather's side here, the, the, the great great grandparents. He's matching this family and this family, the Allens and the Browns Kennedys. So this tells us that Steve is coming from a marriage between those two families. And we have a marriage between those two families. And that's my great grandparents, David and Alice. So just to be clear, Here's our logic puzzle. If Steve has Allen DNA and Brown DNA, then he has to be descended from a marriage or relationship between those two families. And there is a marriage and that's between David Allen and Alice Brown. So those are the most likely, most recent common ancestor couple between me and Steve. So that's sometimes abbreviated MCRA. So they're that common ancestor couple. 
So I need to be looking in their family for Steve's father. Does that make sense to everybody? So if there hadn't been a marriage between the Allens and the Browns, then that would indicate that there had been a relationship of some sort um, that resulted in a child that would be Steve's, um, Steve's father. So there are other situations, but hope usually you're going to find a marriage and a marriage record and you're going to be able to say, oh yeah, this is why they're sharing Allen and Brown DNA because there was a marriage between those two families. So once I learned this, this put Steve as a much closer relative to me than I thought he was initially. And I started having second thoughts. Remember how, how gung-ho I was at the beginning? I was like, oh yes, I would help any adoptee that, that um, approached me, you know? Of course I would. I, would. I would be glad to give them, you know, this information. Well, now I kind of had these second thoughts and I had some, a couple sleepless nights and I thought to myself, I know my grandpa Alan's family pretty well. I go to family reunions. I've seen them for years. I'm acquainted with a lot of them and I didn't want to harm my relationships with, with these people. Um, I felt it was a potential tricky, tricky situation. So I spoke to my dad about it and he calmed me down. Now my dad is quite elderly right now, but he has, and his mind is not what it once was, but he has consistently said over the years that the Allens are very kind, generous people. They're loving, they have a good sense of humor. They don't take themselves seriously and that family is everything to them. And if they found a new family member, they would be thrilled. That, that was his opinion. And so he urged me to continue. And I decided to continue, but I also gave myself permission to stop at any time. So if I started to feel uncomfortable, I could pull back and maybe just kind of take a rest for a while or stop altogether, depending on what I found out. But that I would, I had a good feeling about Steve. I thought he was a nice guy. I, I didn't have any qualms about working with him. Um, so I felt like, you know, I'd have to be very careful in how I approached it with him, but I thought he would probably understand if I had to take a break. So that's what I decided to do. And I continued. So how is Steve actually related to me then? So I have to take a deep dive into my great grandparents and their family. So here they are. And I so David Allen and Alice Brown are my great grandparents, and we've decided that Steve and I must both descend from them because we both have Allen and Brown DNA, and there's only the one marriage between those two families that we know of. So you can see over on the left that my grandfather is David Jr., and he's born in 1905, and the other siblings were born around that same time period, uh, 1900 and 1910. And there's five siblings total. And we've got, to, we've got to fit Steve onto this tree somewhere. So they were in Southern Indiana. They were not in the South at all. So the, the state that Steve is from, this family is not from there. Um, and I don't know of any branch that has lived in the South. Um, I'm using, I'm gonna use fake names for everybody on this, um, everybody that we talk about. Um, going forward, except for my own grandfather and my father. I'm, and I'm not using fake names for them, but I'm using fake names for everybody else just to protect the identities of these closer family members to mine. So this is a picture of my grandpa and some of his siblings and his siblings, um, probably from the 50s or the 60s. And um, it's not the best photo, but it's it's the one that I had that I could kind of pop into this PowerPoint today. And I don't know why my grandma's cut off, but my grandma's over on the very right and my grandpa's standing behind her. And then there's my grandpa's siblings and some of their spouses. So we're gonna have to take a deep dive into this family. And remember, we're looking for a father for Steve. So we're looking at males who would have been alive in 1969, who could have fathered a child at that time period. And we have to be ruthless with this. 
We have to include my grandfather. We have to include my father as possible suspects. We have to include geriatric men because, you know, we've all heard of men who have fathered children in their 80s and 90s. It's unusual, but it happens. And we have to include younger teenage boys. Through a process of elimination, deductive reasoning, and biographical research and DNA research, we will determine who Steve's birth father was among all the male suspects. So let's start with my grandpa and my father. And we're going to, I'm going to give you a little hint. We're going to rule them out. But we need to, we need to look at them. We cannot have blind spots in our um, research. And we can't say to ourselves, my grandpa would never do that, or my dad would never do that. So I have put in, and the dotted lines are possible scenarios where Steve could fit in on my close family tree here. And you can see we've got David and Alice at the top, and then we've got David Jr. That's my grandpa. And my first scenario is here in the middle. David Jr. dot, dot, dot to Steve. So this would be a scenario, an unlikely scenario where Steve would be my grandfather's son. My grandfather would be about 65 when um, Steve was conceived. But that would make Steve my dad's half brother. And that would make Steve my half uncle. And that seems unlikely, but we're going to look at Son of Morgans in a minute. And um, the Son of Morgans share between me and Steve, and we will talk this through. The second scenario is that my grandfather had an unknown male son. So that's over here on the right, the, the dotted line over on the right. And this has happened before in other families. I've seen it in people that I've been helping with their DNA. So it can happen. Unknown male son. Maybe my grandfather didn't even know he had him. And that guy would have been would be the father of Steve. That would make Steve my half first cousin. And then the third scenario where we're trying to fit Steve into my family personally is my dad. My dad was alive in 1970. My dad was perfectly able to father a child in 1970. So we have to consider him. And so that would put Steve down here as my half brother. Okay, so we're ruling that out. And this is because of Sunamorgans. Remember how Steve shares 145 Sunamorgans and he's predicted to be my second to third cousin? Well, if he was my half uncle, he would share about um, 400 and, oh wait, if he's my uncle, yeah, he would, he would share about, um, yeah, if he was my half uncle, he'd share about 900 Son of Morgans with me. If he was my half first cousin, he would share about 450 Son of Morgans with me. And if he was my half brother, he would share 1,800 Son of Morgans with me, give or take a few Son of Morgans here and there. I don't, I don't share anywhere near that many Son of Morgans with Steve. So we are ruling out my grandpa and my dad. So then we need to look at other possibilities. Steve could be the son of one of my grandpa's brothers. He could be the son of my dad, one of my dad's male first cousins, or he could be the grandson of any one of my dad's first cousins, male or female. So those are some other possibilities that we've got to logically go through. So here's the tree and we're eliminating people. So we eliminated David Jr., my grandpa and my dad as possible fathers. Now, Remember I said my grandpa has some brothers. So we've got brother Joe and brother Frank. So I've got dotted lines over here to Steve. Could Steve be the son of Joe or Frank? So that would make Steve and my dad first cousins, right? Does everybody see that? They'd have um, their fathers would be brothers. So we're going to compare. Remember how I said I, I tested my dad at Ancestry? So we're going to go into my dad's match page with Steve. So this is comparing. You can see DA with Steve. And you can see they share 258 centimorgans. So we go over to DNA Painter again. It's our friend. 
And you can see that first cousin is not coming up on that list of possibilities at all. It's way too little. It's a very small amount of DNA that they actually share. Um, a first cousin would share on average about 900 centimorgans of DNA. So, and you're gonna have variations with that. I'm just giving you averages, but you know, 258, way too low. So Steve's father was not one of my grandpa's brothers. So we're going back here and we're ruling out Joe and Frank as the father. So then we have to move. My grandpa had two sisters over here, Mary and Josephine. And of course they didn't father Steve. So we've ruled out this whole line of the children of David Allen and Alice Brown. They are not the father of Steve. We've ruled out my dad. Now my dad has four first cousins that are male. And coincidentally, they're, each of them is from a different sibling of my grandfather. So we've got Joe and Sue Smith had Shane, Frank and Jane Jones had Phil, Mary and Peter Parker had Alfred, and Josephine and Mike McGillicuddy had Hugh. So any one of these cousins are the right age to have fathered a child in 1970. So could one of them be Steve's father? Well, sure they could. How can we figure out if one of them was Steve's father? Well, this is where we've got to remember that if Steve is the son of one of my dad's first cousins, then grandpa's sibling, whichever sibling it happens to be, is going to be one of the parents of that first cousin, and their spouse is going to be the other parent. And Steve's going to have DNA from both of those families. So oh, let's go back up here. So my dad's um, cousin's parents are Smith, Jones, Parker, and McGillicuddy. So Steve's going to have either Smith, Jones, Parker, or McGillicuddy DNA from one of those siblings of my grandfather and their spouses. So that's going to be a key in helping us figure this out, or it should be. So in order to know whether Steve has any matches to those four families, I'm going to have to get access to Steve's DNA results. Fortunately, um, I'm able to do that. Um, I also need to do genealogical research on my grandpa's sibling spouses. So how do you share your DNA results with others? Well, at Ancestry DNA, it's very simple. You go under DNA settings and there's a sharing or a um, invitation basically that you can send to someone to see your DNA results. And they're not able to do anything with them. They can just look at them. So it's like a viewer option. With the other companies, there's no such option. And so you're either having to give them all your login information so they can log into your DNA account, or you're having to share like screenshots with them. It's very tedious, whichever way you do it. Um, and you may have some qualms about sharing your username and password with somebody, and you should be careful with who you share those with. Make sure that the search angel or whoever's helping you is a reputable person. But at Ancestry, it's fairly simple, like I said. And this is what I mean about building a, a pedigree chart and working on the trees. I need to look at all of the people that my grandpa's siblings married. Remember, it was Smith. Sue Smith, Jane Jones, um, Peter Parker, and Mike McGillicuddy. So I'm going to do, I'm going to work up a family tree chart for all of those people. They're the spouses of my grandpa's siblings so that I can better help Steve with this problem because Steve's going to be related to one of those families. So after I had completed those charts, what I did was I searched Steve's match list for those surnames. So I was, you can search um, at all the different DNA companies. You can search for a surname in your matches. You can search um, the trees of your matches and you can search the names of your matches. And so my first thought was to just search 
the um, trees in the match list for that, those names. Well, look at those names for a minute. Smith and Jones, those are two of the most common surnames out there and Parker's not much better. So when I started doing this, you know how many Smiths and Joneses I found? And a lot of them were related to Steve's mother's family because Steve has matches, you know, on his match list to his mother's family. And so these are Southern Smiths and Southern, Southern Joneses. And I kept sorting through all of these people and getting really frustrated. And I just decided this is not a good method for this particular problem. It might work for a different problem. Um, the only thing that I could really say was I didn't find any McGillicuddy's. And so I thought we could rule out um, my grandpa's sister, Josephine, who married Mike McGillicuddy, because I didn't think that that was um, going anywhere. But too many Smiths and Jones and Parkers to sort through. So we need to make a different strategy. And our new strategy is process of elimination. I decided to sort out Steve's matches by process of elimination because he already knew three out of the four grandparents' sides of his family. So he knows his mother and her parents because he's found them. He's reunited with his mother and he's traced her tree. So he can tell whether a DNA match is on his mother's side. He also knows who my family is now and they're the Allen and Brown matches which we've already kind of gone over. And so that is one side of his father's family. There has to be another side of his father's family. And that would be the unknown person who married into my family. So the way this works is that Steve would go through his match list and just eliminate the ones that are from his mother's side and eliminate the ones that are on my side to the Allen and Browns. And there are going to be leftover matches. And those are going to illuminate this unknown grandparent here that must have married into my family or at least had a relationship with somebody in my family to produce Steve's unknown father. When I did that, I there were leftover matches. And I looked at the trees of those matches. And I'm looking for names and clues and places. I'm looking for Southern Indiana for one thing, because all these people are, all my family is headquartered in Southern Indiana. And I'm also looking for names. And I'm looking for the same name over and over again. So I can say, okay, he has a, a group of matches that are all this family name. So this might be important. And so bingo, when I looked at these leftover matches, he had multiple matches to a family named Judson and they lived in Southern Indiana. And so I said, aha, this must be it. And I vaguely recognized the name Judson and I asked my dad about it. And he said, yes. He said, one of my cousins, Connie, married a man named Judson. And I said, aha. So then I wanted, to, I needed to do genealogical and biographical research on Connie and her husband, and her husband's name was Jed Judson. And sure enough, when I did some research on who Jed Judson's family was, I did a pedigree chart on him and his family, his parents, his grandparents, and so forth. They were the same Judsons that were in Steve, Steve's DNA match list. So the two families were matching up. So what are the chances? Again, here we have logic. What are the chances that Steve is matching to a family of Judsons who married into my family without it being the correct Judson that we need. So I don't, I don't believe in coincidences. I mean, there, there could be a coincidence, but most likely this is the connection we are looking for. Connie Allen and Jed Judson are probably Steve's grandparents. So we need to look at their family and research this couple really intensely. Where were they living in the different census years? Who were their children? Um, what were they doing for a living? What was going on? We need to do some biographical research into this family. Here is a picture of a lot of my dad's um, female cousins and Connie is one of them that's listed, that's pictured there. So 
again, I'm sorry, it's not the best picture. The Allens took a lot of snapshots and a lot of them are kind of faded and also blurry. But um, these are some of my dad's cousins. It says 1942 on the 4th of July. So a lot of um, the family had a big get together every year on the 4th of July. And it sounds like they had just barrels of fun at those get togethers. We have a lot of fun pictures from those. So anyways, here's our family tree going down, starting with our most recent common ancestor couple, David and Alice Brown. Remember that Steve had DNA from both David and Alice, the Brown and the Allens. Um, we have my grandpa, David Allen, my dad and me would be here. And here's where it comes in. We've got Joe Allen, my grandpa's brother, married to Sue Smith. And we did have a few minor DNA matches to the Smiths that I finally found in Steve's match list. Um, but it looks like the Smiths were not a very prolific family, this particular bunch, and nobody in that family has been DNA testing. So it was hard to like find, but there are some matches to Sue Smith's family in his match list. So they weren't left out, but they weren't obvious either. But here's Connie Allen, who is the daughter of Joe and Sue, and she's the one that married Judd Judson. They had two sons. And so one of these men is probably Steve's dad. That would be the conclusion that we have to make after we look at the fact that Steve has DNA from Allen, Brown, Smith, and Judson. So doing kind of a deep dive on the sons, we've got Paul born 1950. So Steve's born in 1970, remember. So um, Paul born 1950, he was, my dad thinks he was in the army in 1970. So it's unknown where he was stationed. Could have been in the South, might not have been, don't know. Um, Paul is still living to the best of my dad's recollection. And I did some research and it looked to me like he was, and he had several children. Then his younger brother, Jason Judson, is the other option. He was born in 1956. That would make him 14 at the time, 13, 14 at the time of Steve's um, conception. That's not out of the question. Um, we, don't, we do know that the Judsons were living in Southern Indiana in 1970, so they were not in this Southern state. And we also know that Steve's mother was never up in Indiana. Um, not living in Indiana, at least for any reason. There's a possible scenario where they vacationed down in that southern state and Jason ran into her somewhere and had a short-lived encounter with her, but um, we don't know. So Jason is deceased, so we can't ask him, but he does have some living children. So my next step was to turn this over to Steve. I have gone as far as I can go. I, I gave him charts where I detailed all of this out in great minutia, kind of what I just told you about how he's related to Allen, Brown, Smith, and Judson's. And that led me to Paul and Jason Judson, the sons of my dad's first cousin, Connie. And I suggested that he contact Paul since Jason was deceased. So, you know, strike on, you know, strike with the brother that's still living and just see what um, he says about all of this. And the ball's in Steve's court at this point. I also gave him a Facebook page that was for Paul and gave him information on, you know, what city Paul was living in. I gave him a template that I give to some of my other um, DNA, um, some of the other people that I help when I'm a search angel that he could use to try to write a letter if he was having trouble kind of getting a letter started. And I also gave him some photos and medical history that I knew about the family. Now my responsibility is over here. Steve decides to make contact or not. I do nothing now. And Steve could decide not to contact this family. And then I don't, I don't contact them. Um, I don't talk or gossip about it in the family. I don't hint around about it to Paul or any other family member that is involved or not involved. I just leave it alone. And that's hard to do. Um, and actually, Steve went through a, a minute or two where he he was undecided about whether he was going to actually contact 
Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, that's going to be rough. I I feel, you know, I've done all this work and then he decides not to contact them, but that's his choice. So his wife convinced him, actually. She looked at the Facebook pages and she said, this man looks just like you. He has to be your father. And so you need to contact him. So Steve did. And Paul confirmed that he was in the army in 1970, that he was stationed in that Southern state that um, Steve was from, and that he did attend a lot of parties and met a lot of women at that time. And I think kind of indirectly said this was entirely possible that this happened. Um, Steve's mother said she recognized the picture of Paul once they showed it to her. Paul was unmarried at the time, and that could be um, a reason why he was receptive to this contact. Um, sometimes, you know, they're not, they are married at the time, and the wife is still in the picture, and she is not inclined to view the situation with a, in a good light. So, and that can sour some people trying to um, contact their, their birth father. Um, but Paul was unmarried at this time, and he acknowledged that it definitely could have happened, and he agreed to take a DNA test. And when it came back, this is what it looks like. This is the match page between Steve and Paul, and it says Paul's his father, right? <laughs> Steve was very, very happy. He was so thrilled. So remember how um, the DNA company predicted that Steve was my second to third cousin. I thought we'd circle around here and just show you what the actual relationship was. He was actually my second cousin once removed. So Paul and I are actually second cousins. And then Steve is one generation below me. And so that makes him once removed from me. It's, it means one generation removed. And DNA Painter did predict that that was one of the options for 145 centimorgans, second cousin once removed. Now, what was the reaction? Well, now I've never met Paul, so I don't know Paul personally. I knew um, some of his family members, but I'd never met Paul. So it, it, it turned out not to be awkward at all for me. Um, but after Paul took the, the um, test, and he came up as Steve's father on Ancestry, he saw me on his match list. And I'm on there as Sarah Allen. So that's my, I'm on there as, with my real name. And so he recognized my name and he said, he messaged me on Ancestry and he said, are you Donnie's girl? And that's my dad's childhood nickname. And I said, yes. And we talked a little bit about my grandparents and he, his memories of going over to their house and how much he loved them. Um, and then he said, kind of, I, I have a feeling that he was waiting for me to say something about it and that Steve might have told him that I was involved. But he finally said to me, well, I found a new son on Ancestry. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. Congratulations. I didn't say anything else. I didn't I didn't fess up to having been involved. But from what I understand, they have um, loaded up their camper and motored on down to see Steve in the southern state where he lives already and that the um, reunion went well. So. I'm very pleased, and actually, I think that is the end of my program, and I hope you um, learned a lot from my experience with helping an adopted person on my DNA match list. All righty, so we do have some questions. So the first one is, um, the person says that they were contacted by a DNA match who tested it, family tree DNA. They know that he's a match to their mother's side of the family, and he doesn't know for certain that he's adopted, but um, mm. no one is is willing to to speak to speak to him. So mm -hmm. she's asking for suggestions. Um, well, it sounds like you're probably doing about the right things. You've asked him for a screenshot of your closest matches and of his closest matches. And hopefully you'll recognize some family members on there. Maybe he'll send you several screenshots down the page. Um, you can have him do the in common with, um, with you at the tool at Family Tree DNA. I think it's called in common with. And that would just like limit it down to his matches that are in common between you and him. 
And you can see from his page how many centimorgans he's sharing with all your different family members. And that might help you and inform you as to where on his on your tree he might be. Um, if he feels comfortable sharing his login and password with you, I mean, you could go that route if he if he would do that. That that might be the best. Um, and if you um, need some more like guidance from me, you can always send us an email and I will be happy to try to guide you a little more um, through it. If you send us an email here at the library, it'll get to me. Okay. And the next question is, um, they're wondering about suggestions for um, asking extended family to test. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, there are always going to be people out there who don't feel uncomfortable about it. And you can try to reassure them that um, the government is not accessing your DNA and the police are not accessing your DNA unless you test at certain companies. Um, they're not accessing your ancestry at 23andMe DNA. And they are if you upload to GEDmatch and you've opted in for that law enforcement to actually um, use your matches at GEDmatch. But um, yeah, sometimes saying less is more, just kind of saying, I got all my relatives to test by basically, everyone knew that I was the person in the family that was interested in the family tree. And so basically, all I really said was, you know, it really helped me with the family tree if, you know, I could get your DNA testing. <laughs> and they all just kind of said, sure. I really didn't have anybody that said no. Um, so I know other people have had to really kind of work on their family members. And, you know, if you know them well, like you can, you maybe know what to say to get them to agree, you know, obviously don't do it when they're in a, don't, don't talk to them about it when they're in a bad mood or, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I don't know. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It can be hard. Yeah. Um, let's see. A first cousin, Ajapti, who found this person via DNA happens to be the only shared match to me only shared match to some others who are shared matches with me. We know who her biological mother is. Is that an indicator that they may be connected to her as a yet unidentified biological father? Yeah. Um, I don't know, Brian, that sounds a little complicated. And if you wanted to, you could definitely send me an email here. Um, and I can try to go over that a little bit more with you and think through some options. So I'd be happy to do that if you wanted um, that help. Because there, there can be times when the shared matching kind of leads you astray or it leads you in another direction or it, there, it provides several different avenues to go down and you're not quite sure what to do. Mine happened to be really straightforward in the example that I gave tonight. And the next question has to do with contacting a match. So this person discovered a 1000 Cinemorgan match, um, made contact with her a while ago, not realizing how they were related um, and not, uh, not sure yet about, mm. about the, yeah. about how, if she knows how closely they're related. So she's wondering if she, should reach out or kind of let her discover the connection on her own. Yeah, yeah. People have different viewpoints about this. A lot of people do think that you should just kind of let them discover it. Um, I'm not quite sure from your comments if she's actually replied to any of your messages and you've been going back and forth with her or not, or if um, she's just never replied. So you're not sure if she's you know, even there on the other end, you know, sometimes people aren't, don't see their messages or they're not logging in or they may be deceased. Um, and so obviously can't check their messages, but, um, so, um, if you wanted to email me with a little more details, I mean, I could give you some more advice about that, this one too. Mm -hmm. And the next question is wondering what, um, search angels charge. I believe that there are, there may be search angels out there that do charge something, but your typical search angel should be doing it for free. And so there are 
a couple groups on Facebook. If you are involved, if you are on Facebook and are comfortable with Facebook, these would be private groups that you can join on Facebook. So nobody else sees the post except for the people in the private group. And there's one called Search Squad. And those people are DNA angels and they're free. They offer you free help. Um, they're affiliated with Cece Moore, who is a, a pretty uh, famous um, search angel herself. Right now, she's doing a lot of work with um, um, Jane Doe and John Doe bodies that are being found, but um, and criminal cases. But she started out as a as an adoption search angel, and so um, she's quite well known. It's a very reputable group. So, Search Squad, you could join that that group, and they would help you for free. And I can, you know, say that they're a reputable group. Um, there's also a website, I think it's called dnaangels.com and they are free and reputable as well. Um, well, they're free if you're looking for your own parents. If you're looking for a grandparent, I think they might charge you a fee. And so if you, if you don't wanna do that, I would circle back and get on Facebook and do the search squad, which is free. Um, the next question, they're wondering about a Y, a Y DNA test and how, um, how that might have affected Steve's um, situation. Mm -hmm. Situation. Yeah, you could have, you could have done, we could have had Steve do a Y DNA. I tend to try to solve cases with as few DNA tests as possible. So if we could solve it by Steve's ancestry DNA, which we actually did, we didn't have to use any other DNA tests, um, that saves Steve money. You know, Steve didn't have to buy the $150 Y DNA test because we figured it out through the ancestry test. But yes, if we were stumped, I would have suggested that he test at maybe 23andMe also, because that's another really... Um, large testing database of people and then possibly the Y DNA if we were still stumped. Yes, that was certainly would be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Good Sounds catch. Good. So we'll do one more. So um, the last one is what about someone who descends from an orphan child and doesn't know about their lineage back from the parent who was orphaned? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, th I would think that you, um, whoever this person is, um, is basically the same as an adopted person. So, you know, the adopted person comes into the DNA testing not knowing who either of their parents are. And so they're just looking at their DNA matches and trying to decipher, like, you know, how I'm related to these people and working on kind of the same process that I was doing a little bit with Steve there but the adopted person is having to do that with all of their DNA matches to try to make some sense of it all. And um, so an orphan who, you know, doesn't know who their parents are is essentially the adopted person in the family. So you would still get DNA matches to the orphan's bio family, um, and, but you'd have to kind of decipher who they are and figure out who they are. Um, and if you wanted to send us an email about that, you know, Pam, I'd be glad to um, advise you further about that as well. That's I see good. one last Thank question you. that I will answer. <laughs> How long did the whole process last? Um, finding Steve's birth family probably took me a couple weeks. I didn't work on it like nonstop. I was kind of stopping and starting, but yeah, a couple weeks. All right. Thank you. So, um, That'll finish us up for this evening, but um, if you would like a copy of the chat for the program tonight, or if you have any additional questions, please send us an email. So it's genealogy at acpl.info, and we'll stick that in the chat. So thank you again for joining us this evening, and have a good night. Bye. Bye.